Top three stories that sound fake, but are hundred percent real. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And today we're gonna to look at three stories that demonstrate. Just after midnight on June 22nd, 1991, Charles Holden was on his way home from work when he decided to stop at a fast food restaurant near his house in Harrington, Delaware. After grabbing a quick bite to eat, Charles left the store and got back in his truck. He turned it on and he was about to drive out of the lot when he stopped because there was this man running towards him, waving, trying to flag him down. So okay. Charles put his truck back in park and he rolled his window down to see what this guy wanted. And when the stranger got close enough, he told Charles that his sister was having a baby and he needed a ride to the hospital which was about 20 minutes away. Charles Hell couldn't no. tell that this guy was lying. It was super late. He didn't know this guy. And he just had a bad feeling about him. And so he told him, no, I'm sorry. It's too late. I got to get home. It's too far out of the way. The hey, yo, you guys know me, bro. Listen, hey, you stop me whilst I'm trying to get my McDonald's? Nah, 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 nah. You got to walk there, bro. You got to walk there, bro. I'm getting my Maccas. He immediately looked dejected and turned around and started walking away. And as Charles was watching him go, he felt bad and said, you know what? Hey, come back here. I'll give you a ride part of the way there. And so the stranger smiled, hopped in his passenger seat, and they took off. Charles drove him approximately three miles in the direction he had asked to go before pulling over on the side of the road and telling him, this is as far as I'm going to take you. Okay. Charles lived only about a block away, and he didn't want to drive too far away from home so late at night. But the stranger, upon hearing he was being let out so soon, suddenly became angry and began fumbling in his pocket like he was going to get a knife or some sort of weapon. Took him he out. started screaming at Charles, hand over your keys, hand over your wallet, or I'm going to kill you. Charles, meanwhile, was on edge, just being in the car with this guy because he had a bad feeling about him and so he immediately jumped into action he turned off his truck he ripped the keys out of the ignition and he leapt out of his truck and started running charles saw way off in the distance was a convenience store and he figured he could run to there and get some help but as he's running he turns around and sees the stranger has also leapt out of the car oh, and was no. now sprinting up to him with a screwdriver in his hand oh, and this no. stranger was running really fast he was gaining on charles and soon charles realized he wasn't gonna make it to the convenience store before this guy caught up to him. And so at some point, Charles just stops, he turns around and he puts his hands up and he says, okay, 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 I'll give you a ride wherever you wanna go and then you can have my keys, my wallet, you can have anything you want. And so the stranger runs right up Yo, to- Yo, hell no, bro. Chat, could you do it? Could you guys give, like, pick up a hitchhiker? I couldn't do it, bro. People are too crazy, man. Charles, and he stops and he smiles because he's very pleased with this result. And he pokes him with the screwdriver and kind of gestures for him to go back to the truck. So Charles walks back to the truck with the stranger right behind him with the screwdriver periodically poking him in the back. They finally get to the vehicle and the stranger tells Charles to get in the car and then wait. But as soon as Charles sat down, he fired up his truck and sped off before the stranger could hop in the passenger side hey, door. Small. And so Charles is flying away from this guy. He looks in his rear view Run mirror and he can see the guy is chasing after him with a screwdriver held over his head, but he sees the stranger at some point just stops, turns around, and walks away. Charles was totally relieved that he had escaped this horrible encounter, and he was thinking about calling the police, but ultimately decided he wouldn't because it was his decision to allow some stranger to get in his car in the middle of the night. And so Charles kind of blamed himself for the whole ordeal. What Charles was concerned about, though, was where he had ditched the stranger was not far from his house, and he was oh. worried if he just turned around and drove right right back to his house that this guy could recognize the truck and then follow him to his house and then who knows what could happen. That is scary. And so Charles decides he's just gonna stay outside of town and drive around for a while to make sure this stranger is long gone by the time he comes back. So after about an hour of doing just that, driving around outside of town, Charles goes back into Harrington, Delaware and he gets on his street and he's shocked when he sees the stranger who had just tried to kill him oh, no. is walking down the road right in front of him. Oh, but luckily no. the stranger did not hear or see Charles pull onto a street. And so Charles immediately throws it in reverse and he gets out of there and he drives off. At this point, Charles decides he needs to tell police because he doesn't know if this stranger actually knows him and that maybe he's targeting him and he's waiting for him at his property. And so he calls 911 and he tells the dispatcher about what had happened earlier and how this guy is now lurking around his property. And the dispatcher tells him they'll send an officer out to him. And so a few minutes later, an officer showed up at the payphone where Charles was and they told Charles they would escort him back to his property and if the stranger was still out in the area they would arrest him 
And so the two of them made their way back to Charles's property. They get there, the stranger's long gone, and then Charles goes into his house. There's no sign of a break-in. There's no sign that anyone was near his property. And so Charles thanks the officer. He feels totally relieved. But before the officer leaves, he asks him if he wouldn't mind doing a quick sweep of his mother's property. She lived right behind Charles on the other side of some bushes. He told the officer her name was Dorothy. She was 70 years old and she lived alone. And he just wanted to make sure nothing happened to her. Okay. So the officer said, no problem, I'll go check in on her. So the officer leaves Charles and goes across his backyard through those bushes into Dorothy's backyard. And right away, he can see the back window on the back door has been smashed. Oh, no. Oh, no, this is going to get bad. Oh, this is going to get crazy. Oh, yo, hey, listen, listen. Look, 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 look. Never give anyone a ride, bro. Never give anyone a ride. It's not worth it, dude and the door itself is slightly ajar. And so the officer draws their pistol and they go up and they enter the house and they look inside, they're yelling for Dorothy, but there's no answer. It's totally dark in the house, it's totally silent. And so after searching the first floor and finding nothing, they make their way up the flight of stairs and they find blood at the top of the landing. And they follow this trail of blood and it brings them into one of the bedrooms where a woman is sprawled out on a bed. It was Dorothy, she had been stabbed to death. It would turn out after Charles had ditched the stranger and sped off without him, the stranger, whose name was Gilbert Cannon, began looking for a place to sleep. And the house he ultimately selected just happened to be Charles's mother's house. After Gilbert broke in through her back door, he saw Dorothy coming down the steps to confront him. And because he was worried she'd be able to identify him, he attacked her with a screwdriver. Gilbert would later tell police that the attack on Charles was completely random. He was just at this fast food restaurant. He saw Charles get into his truck and he thought to himself, if I can get in that guy's truck, I bet I can rob him. And and then after this oh shit bro you gotta be so unlucky man bro in my oh my god you go for food you pick someone up nah i've never given a hitchhiker a ride and i never would i never would i never would bro and then the chances of him getting out the car you leaving him and him killing your mom Bro, that's crazy, Failed man. robbery when Gilbert is out looking for a place to sleep and he breaks into this house and this woman comes down the stairs that he attacks and kills. He has no idea that this woman, Dorothy, is Charles's mother. The entire night was one big, horrible coincidence. What the Gilbert fuck? would plead guilty to the murder and would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Yes, yeah, Simmy, you're crazy, bro. The bully. In 1949, 15-year-old problem child, Ken Rex McElroy, dropped out of school and moved to a tiny farming town called Skidmore, Missouri. There, he began his life of crime, which consisted primarily of theft. At night, he would drive his truck onto Skidmore residents' property, and he would steal their livestock, alcohol, grain, food, antiques, anything he could get his hands on and that he could sell, he would take. And if the owners ever caught him in the act, he would just raise his rifle at them and tell them to go back and side and never report it to the police or he would kill them. And because Rex God. was this big 270 pound monster of a man who was known for having a bad temper and for being really aggressive, people generally just did what he asked and his crimes went totally unreported. In the rare instances that victims would report Rex's crimes to police, Rex would begin intimidating them and their family by staking out their houses at all hours of the night, or he would just walk directly up to these victims and he would say, I will kill you if you testify against me. And if none- Yo, does this guy not have a job, bro? Who's got enough time to do that? None of those tactics worked. Rex used some of his illegal money to hire one of the very best defense lawyers in the entire state, a lawyer who had famously represented the mob, and he would step in and get Rex off of virtually any charge, including the time Rex actually did shoot one of the owners who caught him in the act. What? Over the years, Rex would use these fear and intimidation tactics, not just to make money, but also to prey on young women and girls. In the 1970s, when Rex was in his 40s, he began stalking a local Skidmore girl who was 12 years old named Trina. After assaulting her dozens of times, Rex learned her family was going to be pressing charges against him. So Rex burned down Trina's family's house and killed the family dog, and then threatened to kill the entire family unless they signed paperwork that would legally marry their daughter Trina to Rex. This what? would protect them legally.
legally in case they pressed any charges against him. After the family finally relented and signed off on the marriage, Trina was forced to come live with Rex at his house, and within two years, she became pregnant. After the birth of her child- Wait, 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 wait. Bro, if I was her dad, there would be no more Rex. There would be no more Rex, bro. Ain't no way you sign your door off to him. Live with Rex at his house, and within two years, she became pregnant. After the birth of her child, she took her baby and tried to run away from Rex, and she ran back to her family's new house, and she was hiding there, but Rex tracked her down, he took her and their baby back, and then Rex proceeded to burn her family's house down again, oh my and God, again this killed crazy. their new family dog. By the end of the 1970s, this guy's Rex crazy. wasn't only just the most hated person in Skidmore, he was the most destructive person. He had hurt so many people in town, but it seemed like no one could do anything about it. It was like he was untouchable. Then a single piece of candy changed everything. In 1980, one of Rex's children was at a local grocery store in Skidmore when they were caught stealing a piece of candy. When the shopkeeper asked the child to put the candy back, they refused and it caused this huge fight. And before long, Rex has found out about this huge fight. And Rex, instead of being upset with his child for stealing, he becomes enraged that the shopkeeper had the audacity to accuse his child of a crime. Well, and so Rex began stalking the owner of the store, a 70 year old man named Bo, along with the rest of Bo's family. At all hours of the night, Rex would just show up in front of their house with a gun slung across his lap and he would fire shots into the air. And then during the day, he would walk right up to Bo and he would tell him, I'm going to kill you. And so Bo and his family knew it was only a matter of time before Rex did become violent. Yo, I don't get it, bro. I don't get it. How was someone not shot him? Like, I'm not being funny, bro, but if someone did something to my door or is coming up to me and he's scary and he's saying he's going to kill me, it's every man for themselves. Do you know what I'm saying? It's either me or you, bro. It's either me or you. I, I, I'm going to first talk to the police. If they're not going to do anything, then bye-bye. Bye-bye. Why have why, 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 why a shootout? Why have a shootout? And they were right. In July of that year, Rex showed up at Bo's grocery store with a shotgun in hand, and Bo, who was in the back of the shop loading groceries through the back door, he turns around and he sees Rex walking up to him. They have this heated confrontation where at some point Rex just raises a shotgun and he fires a shot into Bo's neck. Bo was gravely wounded, but he would survive, and Rex would actually get arrested and would be charged with attempted murder. And it seemed like, for once, maybe Rex was actually going to get what was coming to him. Sure. But he didn't. The attempted murder charge was lowered to just assault, and he was given two years in prison. But what? he would only serve one day in jail before being released on bond. And as soon as he was out on bond, he went right to his house, and he got his rifle that had a bayonet attached at the end of it, and he went right to the tavern in the middle of Skidmore, and he began telling anybody who would listen that he planned to finish the job, i.e. he was going to kill Bo. And he described in very graphic detail how he planned to do it, which involved this rifle and this bayonet. Annette. Patrons that were at the tavern. Yo, I'm really hoping Bo just kills him, dude. Because this guy is gonna kill you. There's no way Bo don't get a gun. There's no way, bro. If this is anyone in chat right now, let, let's say this happened to you, you're definitely gonna be ready to fight. You know what I'm saying? that saw Rex and heard these claims, they were scared for Bo. And so they left the tavern and they told city leaders about these threats. And so city leaders at this point, they've had enough of Rex and they decide okay, they're so gonna wait. host this secret meeting that will not include Rex the following morning. So the next morning comes around and all these angry residents, they come to this meeting and they begin discussing, you know, how are we going to handle Rex? We can't use police. We can't use politicians. Nothing can be done. So what are we going to do? How are we going to put an end what? to his reign of terror? And after a while, they came up with a plan. And after the meeting was done, everybody left the town hall, they got their guns, and they made their way over to the tavern where Rex was seen earlier that morning. About 40 of these armed men surrounded the outside of this tavern, and once they were all in place, another smaller group of men that were all armed walked inside the tavern, and they saw Rex sitting at the bar with Trina sitting right next to him. And so these men, they walk up right behind Rex, uncomfortably close, right behind him, and they just stand there with their guns looking at him. And at some point, Rex turns around and sees them, and he's about to 
lash out and start fighting them, but he realizes he's totally outnumbered, and these men that are standing all around him, they look like they mean business. And so he stands up, he grabs Trina, and he brushes past them, trying to act tough, and he walks out of the tavern. When he gets outside, he's taken aback at this additional group of armed men, which is much larger, who are all standing there just looking in at him. And so Rex, at this point, becomes visibly frightened, but he grabs Trina and he calmly walks out to his truck, which is parked a little ways out in front of the tavern. He gets in the driver's side, she hops in the passenger side, and Rex lights a cigarette up, he turns on his truck, and bully he's about to try to drive away when a gunshot rings out, and Rex immediately slumps forward onto his wheel. One of the Skidmore residents runs up to the truck, they open up the passenger side, and they grabbed Trina, who was unhurt, pulled her out, and rushed her to safety. Once she was clear... Wait, why would they wait till, he, till he's in the car to shoot him? Why would you not shoot him outside? Why would you wait till he's in the car with the gill? The other residents with their guns just moved in on the truck, and for 20 seconds, they opened fire on Rex. After the shooting was over, nobody called an ambulance. Everyone just stood there and watched as the town bully died. In all, there were 46 witnesses that were there when Rex was murdered, but they all said they had either not seen the shooting or they didn't know who the shooter was. And despite a lengthy federal investigation, none of the witnesses ever changed their stories. And so Yo, imagine being that hated. You get gunned down by 46 people. Bro, that is mad. That is mad. <laughs> Yo, that's mad. So as a result, no one was ever charged with Rex's murder. Years later, a Skidmore resident, when asked what happened here, they just said that man needed a killing. Bro, yeah, he was a full-on bully, bro. Bro, I'm, su I'm surprised. I'm surprised that Dad didn't fucking kill him himself. 81 minutes. On the morning of March 18th, 1990, a young woman named Karen parked her car just outside of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. This famous museum is home to over 15,000 pieces of priceless art from ancient Rome, medieval Europe, Renaissance Italy, Asia, the Islamic world, and 19th century France and America. The outside of this four-story building is strikingly plain, but inside is strikingly gorgeous. There is this lush green open-air court yard that sits right in the middle of the museum that all of the galleries look down into. Karen was an art enthusiast and she was a security guard at this museum and that day she was on duty. After parking her car she got out and walked her way over to the employee entrance and there she pressed the buzzer and announced her arrival. Oh wait I thought that was one of my sound alerts bro. That was the actual video. Out and walked her way over to the employee entrance, and there she pressed the buzzer and announced her arrival to the two night shift guards that she would be relieving. But after a few seconds, the night shift guards did not respond to her and they did not unlock the door. And so after a little while, Karen pressed the buzzer again and said, I'm here, can you please open the door? But again, the guards that were on duty did not respond back to her Rude. and the door did not open. This was highly unusual, so Karen left the door, found a payphone, and called the chief of security for the museum who lived out in town and told him she couldn't get in the building. And so about 10 minutes later, the chief of security shows up and he takes Karen and he walks her around to the other side of the building. He leads her up an outdoor flight of stairs to another entrance to the museum. He pulls out a big ring of keys, he finds the right one, and he opens the door. The entrance they were going through, place them in this dark hallway that stretched out straight in front of them, and then at the very end of the hallway on the right was this very brightly lit room that the door was wide open to, and that was the security office where the guards were supposed to be. And so okay. Karen and the chief, they begin walking down this hallway, expecting to get to the end of it and look inside this room and see these guards and get an explanation for why they didn't buzz Karen in in the first place. But when they reach the end of the hallway and they look in this office, there's nobody inside of there. And now that they were up close, they could see the door leading into the security office had been smashed open. In fact, the doorknob to this door had been smashed off and was laying on the ground. And then next to it, right in front of them, was this metal crowbar. And then above them, the one camera that would have seen whatever had happened in the hallway, it had been turned around and was facing the wall. So Karen and the chief, they know they've stumbled on something that's probably really bad. They don't 
know what it is. They don't know if there's still people inside the museum. They don't know where the guards are. So the chief just grabs the crowbar for Robbery. protection and he and Karen run into the office and they call police. Although they didn't know it yet, Karen and the chief had just discovered one of the most famous crimes in history. The night before, 23-year-old security guard Rick Abath trudged his way down the walkway towards the employee entrance of the museum. He and another young man named Randy were scheduled to work the overnight shift that night. Rick hated his job at the museum because it was incredibly boring, but Rick didn't really have many other employment opportunities to choose from. He was a guy that had dropped out of music school and spent most of his time smoking marijuana, drinking beer, and playing in his friend's rock band. And so he just kept this job that he hated. Once Rick got inside the museum, he walked over to the office where he found his partner that night, Randy, was already sitting behind the desk. After chatting with him for a few minutes, Rick said he would do the first set of security rounds. And so he grabbed a walkie talkie and a flashlight and he headed out to the exhibit halls. Almost immediately, a fire alarm went off. Rick went to the area where it was going off and he investigated and did not see a fire. And so he just turned the alarm off. The building was very old and it wasn't uncommon for their electronic to fail or glitch. And so after this, Rick didn't think much of it. He continued doing his security rounds. And after about 30 more minutes of that, he made his way back down to the security office where he traded places with Randy. Rick took the seat behind the desk and Randy took the walkie talkie and flashlight and headed out into the exhibits. About 30 minutes later, while Randy was still doing his security rounds, Rick had his head down on the desk when he heard the sound of the buzzer coming from one of the outside doors. He lifted his head up and he looked at the screen that was connected to the camera looking down at whoever was was outside at this door and he saw there were two police officers standing right outside the door. And so he reached over and he pressed the intercom button and he said, hey, can I help you? And the officers said they were there responding to a disturbance call, can they come inside? Now, Rick didn't know what this was about. He assumed it must have to do with maybe the fire alarm that had gone off earlier, or maybe somebody outside had seen someone trying to break in and they had called it in. But either way, he felt like it was important enough that he should let them in, even though it was against protocol to allow anyone into the museum after hours, including police. And so the two officers, they come through the doors and they wind up in the hallway right outside of the security office. And there's a window into the security office. So both the officers- Yo, I want to know why is it so famous though? Is it famous because they're rubbing something like expensive rick can see each other and the officers immediately say to rick hey are you working alone tonight and rick says no my partner is out doing security rounds he'll be back soon and uh -oh. so the officers just kind of nod their heads and they're looking around the room uh -oh. for a second and one of them as he glances at rick again he does kind of a double take and he goes wait a minute i think i know you there's a warrant out for your arrest you need to come out here and show me your id and so Rick is caught completely off guard, but he just kind of instinctively does what he's told because it's a police officer. And so Rick stands up, he walks out of the office, he goes out into the hallway, and as he's about to present his ID to the inquiring officer, the officer just grabs him, pushes him up against the wall, and handcuffs him. And so before Rick can say anything- Yo, Rick that's smart, you know. Doing a robbery as a police officer. That's actually hella smart, because you can do that. Randy, his partner, comes back from doing his security rounds. He walks into the hall and has no idea what's going on. The other officer, the one that had not handcuffed Rick, grabs Randy and does the same thing, presses him up against the wall and handcuffs him. And so as Randy and Rick are standing there up against the wall with their hands behind their back, they're looking at each other, they're looking around thinking, what's going on here? And at some point, Randy just blurts out, why are we being arrested? And that's when one of the officers just says, oh, you're not being arrested you're being robbed. Rick and Randy were led oh, by shit. the foster cops down into the basement of this building where they were bound and gagged with duct tape. And then these two thieves proceeded to spend the next 81 minutes walking all around the museum, ultimately stealing 13 pieces of art before destroying the security footage and then fleeing the building. Rick and Randy were discovered unhurt later that morning by police still tied up in the basement. Despite dozens of suspects, Ma numerous viable theories, and a massive monetary reward, these two art thieves were never caught and remain at large today. As for the 13 pieces of stolen art, one of which includes the extremely rare Rembrandt painting called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, which is his only seascape in existence, they are still unaccounted for. And combined, they are worth a staggering $500 million. Oh, what? Yo! Wait, 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 wait. They robbed 500 mil in art and they've never been caught. Yo, I'm in the I'm in the wrong line of work, bro. I'm in the wrong line of work. 
Bro, what? So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments. Mod. Mod. Yeah, where do you even sell that stuff, though? Like, that is so expensive.